Greetings, Patrick here, a question Swift, and welcome to the show. Uh, so yeah, we are uh, about ready to hit April uh, in a big way. April is going to be busy, 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 busy. And uh, tonight we're starting it off with a return visit by our friend Gabrielle Archambault. She will be here in about 15 minutes. Uh, well, once once I hit that button there, all right, so, oh, uh, yeah, okay, so, yeah, uh, StreamYard, good old StreamYard, uh, I just heard some wonderful news for our good friend, uh, Brandon Rhinus from, uh, uh, higher, higher, uh, uh, higher university. I heard that uh, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, if everything goes right, I'm Haunted 2 will be out tomorrow. I, I heard that. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, 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 that means Jamie will be uh, in the movie. Uh, and uh, we'll see Genesis come back. Um, yeah, I'm Haunted. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to review that. I had so much fun with that movie. God, that was, what a, that was so much fun. So much skill. I really got to give Elizabeth. Uh, I, I I just keep on ranting and raving about that. I love movies like that where it's just one character. It's just a bottle room. It's a bottle. It's a bottle room. Uh, a movie or a TV show, and it focuses just on that one character, and um, it's a lot of work. You really can see how how. Uh, Yes. Yep. I'm haunted too. You can see that. You can see the, so much work that goes into doing a movie like I'm haunted uh, when you're. It's just you and the camera, uh, the actor, the camera, the director, and it's just so much work. And the first time I ever really saw a movie like that, uh, it was a movie called Lock with Tom Hardy. Um, after that, I was just like, this is this is just a tour de force. Um, it's like a one man play but uh, you know in a in a movie setting so um so if that happens tomorrow that i will be very very excited to see that um now we've had gabrielle on the show before uh she came here and visited us and tonight we will be talking to her about some upcoming projects uh and seeing what she's been doing since we last talked to her um she has a, a upcoming play coming up, uh, which we're very excited for her. Uh, we're very excited for her. And um, and we're going to talk to her about some other projects as well, including one that she did called Lion Girl. She she had a part in Lion Girl, which was one of the best films I saw last year. And I commented on that, uh, that li I really liked Lion Girl quite a bit. Um, very, very fun movie. Very underrated. Uh, hopefully people will we'll get a chance to see that um man we were we were talking among ourselves you know about that about lion girl we were we were both talking about how incredibly impressive derek mears was uh derek mears did a great job in that movie in fact i think he stole that movie and the fact that he actually got you know he was a main character he had a lot of lines i've never seen uh, i've never seen uh, I've never seen Derek Mears have as many lines in a movie or a project as he has here. And it was really good to see. He, he is a good actor. Uh, he made a great bad guy. And, um, yeah, he just he just needs more of them. He needs people to give him, give him a chance. Um, I've always felt that way with Kane Hodder, too. Uh, you know, a lot of, you know, Kane Hodder and, and Taylor Maine. Oh, my God. Why Taylor Maine is not a major star, it blows my mind uh, when I think about it. Uh, he, he's got charisma, he's got size, he, he's got he's got the skills, and yet he never got really a chance to do any like you know like the Expendables. Put him in a freaking hero movie, you know? Uh, yeah, we know who he is. We know who he is uh, uh, as far as a bad guy goes. But man, oh man, give, give give him a you know give him a give him a script. Um. Uh, yeah, I'm not holding my breath on that, Stephen. And welcome into the show. I'm not holding my breath on that. 
uh, I did try I try to talk to her a couple of times. I never got any response to that. So I'm that's just if she wants to, she knows where I'm at. I'm not I'm not hard to find. Um, uh, 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 you know what? <sighs> Yes, you know, yeah, you know, some of these, you're right. Some of the older actors, like Taylor Maine uh, uh, and Al Pacino, she's been, um, you know, he's been doing a lot of good cop movies lately. A lot of his work lately has been straight to video. Now, I'm not really sure how, I, I heard that his his role in The Irishman was actually the best, um, though I didn't much think about that movie. The Irishman brought out more laughs. And I know it wasn't intended to be the funny, but it brought out more laughs than not because you had all these uh, fine actors, uh, fine actors, but they're all in their 80s. You know, they're all in their 80s or late 70s. And you got them act. Martin Scorsese had them acting like they were in their 30s. You know, and it just didn't work at all. It was it was painful to watch on on the screen, uh, you know, trying to see trying to see Robert De Niro curb stomp somebody and you're worried that he's going to fall and break his hip that's not sort of a look you really want um but you got young guys you got younger guys like taylor main and 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 Derek mears kane hotter um maybe kane hotter may not be quite so young anymore but you had all these bad guys that could have really just walked in there and you know with the right script let them have some roles let them have some speaking roles let them let them emote. That's what I'm saying. You know, slap slapping a mask on them. Okay, be Michael again for the tenth time. You know, uh, uh, here we're gonna have you play Sabretooth, but you can't see anything. <laughs> that that the first X Men movie that ever was made with Taylor Main play Sabretooth. People talk about when when Ryan Reynolds, um, when Ryan Reynolds, uh, uh, his uh, Deadpool character, his was uh, had his mouth erased and he couldn't speak and they thought about how crazy is that it goes back to the first x-men movie when when uh uh when taylor main played uh T tyler main played uh saber tooth and wasn't allowed to to say hardly anything and anybody who reads the comic books know that saber tooth he's a he's an incredible character he really is he's an incredible character you just don't know if you know He's rich. He's a rich character. Hey, Mike, how are you, sir? How are you? Uh, hopefully you're doing well. Hopefully you're doing well. Um, uh, did you do a uh, Did you do a Maxine reaction th uh, a video? I I I got something wild. So I did my I did my uh, Maxine trailer reaction. I. I'm not so sure. I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't know what that is. I came to the conclusion of this, you know, because because I was just trying to figure this out, watching this, watching the trailer. And there's just certain things I saw in the trailer. And now maybe this is my imagination more in the wild. And that's a good thing, right? I'm not exactly sure she's still with us. I don't, I'm not exactly sure. There are some real, there are some signs in that trailer that that did, one didn't make any sense unless unless something diabolical happened. Uh, like I can't imagine why a private detective would be looking for for Maxine at all. Um, I, I have no idea why that would happen. There's a scene where she sees a little girl in the uh, uh, in the in the psycho house. When she rolls into the base motel. Now, me and Wes were talking about this. The Isler were talking about this. He says, you know, he said Pearl and, and Maxine are two distinct characters. I'm not so sure about that, watching that trailer. I, I'm not so sure. I mean, maybe they are, but maybe maybe Maxine didn't escape as much as we thought that she did. I, I don't know. I, I have a feeling maybe there's still, maybe she's still stuck in that house with Pearl in, from the first movie, from X. And maybe she's just, you know, maybe she, well, she's, maybe she's having a vision. Maybe she's having a, a last hour on earth type of memory, you know, uh, when they say, you know, your life passes before your eyes. I'm not so sure that 
that Maxine is, uh, I'm not so sure she's actually alive in the third movie. <laughs> that's a, that's crazy, right? I'm just, I'm just not sure. Um, now we do know that the Night Stalker was based on a real person. He was based on Richard Ramirez and, I lived in Los Angeles at that time. I, I grew up in Los Angeles, Southern California, and the, the Night Stalker was very real back then. He was he was a nightmare. Um, he came. He he was everywhere. That's the thing about the Night Stalker was was he was everywhere. Um, he was spotted in all different towns. He just wasn't based in one little area. He traveled all of Southern California. Uh, a friend, a, a, a friend of mine, his mom saw him walking across the street in her subdivision. She didn't know who he who he was until he saw on the news, and then she about had a heart attack because she recognized him from the news. She says, "I saw that guy. I saw that guy." I mean, she was terrified. Um, but uh, but yeah, so we know the Night Stalker will be a big part of. Uh, of Maxine, it sort of has. A, it also has that sort of a vibe of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood vibe. Well, there is a alternate history. Uh, what Tarantino did, he made it. You know, that's his fantasy was to make you know Charles Manson buy the farm. I guess whatever. Uh, maybe the same thing with Maxine. Maybe she's fantasizing too. You know, going to become a big star and you know, you know what not. It would not surprise me to see her at the end of Maxine if she is dying to see her back at the farm that we saw in Pearl. It would not surprise me at all. It would not surprise me. It would be it would be interesting, and it would be very Ty West. Ty West. Uh, Ty West is a, a tremendous script writer. Screen. Uh, uh, he he writes some great scripts. His storytelling is really cool, and he writes he writes very very well uh, supernatural horror. I would not surprise me. I'm just putting it out there that maybe that's where Maxine is going. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see, I know. Uh, so while we wait for Gabrielle, I will go ahead and break out the calendar. Uh, we are going to be hitting a very busy month here. And today we are doing it now. Um, so here's what we got. Uh, uh, uh. All right. So here's what. Up. Oh. <laughs> well, we'll save the calendar for a little bit later. Uh, but the doorbell has rang, so you know what that means. That means it's time to go get our guest. Thank you all for coming up and show and, and showing up and representing. Share us out if you can. I appreciate it. Uh, and let's please help me welcome in actress uh, and director and producer, uh, uh, Gabrielle Archambault. Here we go. Ta-da! Hi, Gabrielle. Hey. How are you? Good, good, good. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. You look, you look yeah. amazing. You look amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So I uh, so Lion Girl has a sister, huh? Well, you know, um, so, so in the movie, I actually play um, Derek Mears' character's mom. Yeah. Which is you, funny. You know, it was funny. We Right before he came on, I was saying how he, I was talking about how you and I were talking about Derek Mears in that movie and how he just he you know he really stole the movie from me i mean i love i love everybody in the film i mean it's a great film but i was most happy for him and because you know he he gets you know he gets stuck playing the swamp thing he got stuck playing uh, uh jason Voorhees. you know he's one of those big guys that gets here here's a mask you know and that's that's the extent of his acting you know, a lot of people say Derek Mears, and the first thing they think of is Swamp Thing or or Friday the 13th, or uh, if he did a Halloween movie, he did a Halloween movie. But not very many people, not very many people are going to sit there, raise their hand, and sit there and say Lion Girl, because they're, I don't, they're not used to seeing him actually get a chance to actually speak lines. 
Um, yeah, it was it was really nice to get to uh, watch a movie where yeah I saw his face and got to hear him talk and you know I, I think I hope he had fun uh, doing the character. It, it looked like a lot of really fun scenes they shot. He looked he looked happy. He looked happy. I mean I I you know there's some other actors out there that you know like uh, uh, Kane Hodder. We all know Kane Hodder for his roles as Jason. Again, another one where he wears the mask and says nothing. I mean, that's on one hand, I guess on one hand, yes, you have that notoriety. You do. You have the notoriety. Everybody talks about, hey, is Kane Hodder, you know, Derek Muir. You got that, you get that one notoriety, and that's on that one level. But between you and me as an actress, you know, as an actor, would you wouldn't you rather be, wouldn't you rather be able to just talk for like to have five or ten lines in a movie than no lines at all and be stuck there with a mask on? Yeah, I think I think it definitely provided like a more interesting opportunity. Um, like, yeah, for me, I definitely would want to, you know, be able to showcase myself as like a performer. And um, I know sometimes even, you know, wearing a mask, it's like you, you have to do a lot more physical work, which is kind of interesting. but um, it sort of feels like, you know, is it a stunt person? Is it really you? You know, what's, what's going on? Um, so yeah, I think for me, I would want to be able to say a few lines at least. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so too. You know, and we've, we've heard stories about other actors who get scripts and, um, and, and counted their lines how many lines they have in the movie, you know, their lines are important, you know, parts are important, you know, uh, trying, you know, I've heard, a sto I've heard stories where, you know, actors have said that, yes, they've had a line, you know, what they, you know, how the line was, was, you know, was, was uh, written, but they still managed to try to squeak out a couple more words, you know, like, here's your I, coffee, I'm, here's your coffee, ma'am, oh, have a great day. You know, they're trying to squeeze out just a little bit more, you know, just a tiny bit more. And um, it, it is important because, you know, because you just never know who's going to see it. Right. I mean, I was thinking watching I was watching Lion Girl and I'm, I'm sitting there watching Derek act and I'm going like, you know, I really hope as hell that this is a door opener. Like I, not only for Derek, but for some other unknown actors, like one of my favorite actors is, is Taylor Maine that guy's amazing he's a really fine actor but he never really gets to show it off too much you know it's always the hulking killer he was uh played michael myers uh uh in rob zombie's halloween uh his character Sabretooth in x-men again give me a scream oh my god I, I just it drove me nuts um i just feel i have empathy for actors like for yourself, I could not, if you were featured in a movie, Gabriel Archambault, and I'm going to go see you play in that movie or that play, and you got like five or ten lines in it, I probably wouldn't be too happy. You know, I really wouldn't. I'd be like, why so small of a role? Why so small? I so, you know, why, you know, because we're fans. We're, we're fans. We 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 want to we want to be involved in the story. We want to immerse ourselves in the story, and we want to we want we want to see it through our actors that we like. Like for me, it would be like I want to see how you see it through your eyes, but I also want to see how you express it. Does that sound Does that sound Does that sound fair? Does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, to me, it, it's also like um, there's a level of uh, to it for me of how complex is part you know sometimes if you're in a supporting role you can maybe have less lines than the lead but something more interesting um or even just an opportunity to kind of show a character that has a lot of levels and i did feel like um for derek there's you know different levels to this character that maybe he got to show because he was able to show his face um and the not just be this hulking character but also you know what made him be the villain in this situation you know what what sort of drove his character's motivation which um you know i feel like it had a opportunity for that in this film and that's kind of the things that 
I look for in a role is, uh, of course, I, I like when there's a lot of lines for myself, but also, <laughs> you know, how interesting of a character is it to portray, um, you know, how much of my range do I get to show in the character? Um, is it something that I haven't done before, a little different? I know sometimes it's kind of hard to break out of something that people already see you as. You know, and I think that can be a good opportunity in some of these more indie films for people who have done sort of blockbuster circuit to be able to say, okay, I'm going to do this, you know, project that's a little more independent, but it's going to let me show something that people haven't necessarily seen from me in the past. I, I guess this is a, this is a, a case where you know a term that actually, I mean, you really don't hear the term too much anymore, but I guess it is still out there. And, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say that typecasting is still there. And to me is, you know, like, you know, you, you've done some writing too. You've done some script writing, some screen, some screen, uh, uh, screenwriting. You played a lot of different roles. I mean, something like typecasting is not something you hear too much these days about like, yeah, you know, all, all, because, you know, the diversity, you know, now, now it's no longer just certain people, you know, playing certain roles, you know, the Latino is going to play the main, you know, the brother's going to play the gangbanger, the, the white guy's going to play the, uh, the, you know, white collar guy, you know, now, now all those roles are all mixed up in a mixing bowl and that's a beautiful thing. Um, but you have a, but, but I guess, I guess you got to be careful for some of these actors like Derek Mears and what have you, they still get typecast. They still get pinned in those roles where they have no room to breathe. Um, now, have you ever acted with an actor who's had a reputation for like being like, maybe just like a bad guy all the time or being, a, a, you know, like a girl being the, the kill the first time through, you know, the girl always dies, you know, uh, have you run across it? Have, and if that is something, is that something that you yourself fear uh, uh, being typecast? Um, I think for myself, I, I do kind of have a type that I get cast in quite a bit, um, which is sort of either somebody who is what, like a, a house person or a prostitute with like a heart of gold or the opposite of that, which is like somebody who seems like they're really nice, but then is like some sort of psychopathic killer um, or like mentally unstable. So I, I sort of play two separate things, but I have worked with the um, who gets typecast a lot, and that's Luke Baines. Um, and my like dream for Luke is for him to be in a rom com. I really want to see him because he has he really knows like the angles of his face, and he has a really interesting look um, that kind of gets him stuck into this sort of evil guy murderer. Um, but when you speak to him in real life. He's like the sweetest, nicest, friendliest person, like so genuinely great. And I would absolutely love to see him in a role like either as just a straight up rom-com or kind of takes that typecasting and turns it on its head where you like think he's the bad guy, but he's actually the nice guy. And somebody who seems like the nice guy is the bad guy. Yeah. I I like those kind of turns. I I do. You know, either way, you know, like like you know, somebody comes up there, and next thing you know, they're the bad guy, and you're going like, whoa, I didn't see that. You know, I didn't see that coming. Or or the you know, or, or there's the you know, or there's the bad guy, or, you know, coming to save the day. You know, and and anti hero, like you didn't expect that. I I like that because it shows some creativity for the character. You know, it's not you're not just getting stuck. And and um, I I do like that. Um. Now, as a screenwriter, because I, 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 because I noticed this, you've been writing a lot since the last time uh, you were here. Um, talk to us a little bit about about uh, uh, about. I know we're hitting the ground a little. Maybe I should slow this down for a second. First of all, how the hell have you been? I've been great. I've been great. I've been really busy and working on a lot of projects and uh, hanging out with my cats, which is always awesome uh i i have them uh next to me while i'm writing or working so uh they're inspiration and um, uh yeah yeah how how goes the writing i think i think you had 
you were writing uh, like you had like two or three different things going last time we talked. Um, so tell us a little bit what, what have you been working on it and what stage of it is it? Have you got anything uh, to the pitch stage yet? Or are you still fine honing scripts? Um, what's it what's it like writing? Um, what's it like writing the script? And have you written yourself a part in, in everything that you've written so far? Um, sometimes I do write a part for myself uh, or like a, maybe like a cameo, but I think at this stage, I'm sort of keeping them a little bit separate just in that it's a lot easier to sell a script without necessarily having myself attached um, yeah. versus, you know, trying to make it sort of this double deal where I'm doing both things. Um, I have a couple of scripts that are at the pitch stage. Um, I have a TV pilot and I'm sort of doing a rework on that. I did sketches and got some feedback. Um, it's based off a book series called Amish Vampires in Space, um, which I think would be good for your audience. Uh, it's sort of a horror yes. thriller. Um, it understands like that it's called Amish Vampires in Space, but it's not super kooky. It's a little bit um, more on the serious side. So um, doing some rewrites on that and kind of taking a little more risks with it. I felt like the first version was a little too safe. And I feel like if I'm going to, you know, go out there, something as crazy as Amish vampires in space, I want to really go for it. Um, and then and you, you still find yourself writing in like a network type uh, a script versus say a streamer type. I, I had, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I was, I, I don't have, I haven't watched TV in about 10, 12 years. Um, wow. uh, uh, so like when some of these shows I see on TV, like, uh, like when I see the walking dead or breaking bad, I am completely blown away. You know, you know, it is cable, but I'm still blown away by the language in the, in those series. And I'm sitting there and because before, like I would never ever see commercials with with those shows like you know trying to sell an ad move in a, you know in a in a, in a uh, uh, series like that with the profanity and the violence i just never would have ever suspected we see that but um but yeah i mean cable cable tv shows or streamer shows it's it's uh it's anything goes i mean um linear station networks are it's very it's very hard to write for them because they're all I mean, I mean, it's hard because it's like it's such a small box, you know. Like, okay, I can't say this, I can't do that, I can't show this, I can't, you know, because it's on network TV. So, as a script writer, as a screenwriter, you're sort of like you're sort of handicapped, you know. You're sort of like, God, I, I don't want this to be stuck in a uh, in a Law and Order series. I want it, I want it to be like more like Breaking Bad. So. Is that hard? I mean, is, is that you know? Do you find yourself making your your script more edgier? Is it easier to make it a little bit more edgier? It's got to be more. It's got to be more easier to to make it more adult than it than than to fit an audience uh, of like you know like family audience, right? Yeah, I mean, so it's actually based off a Christian book series. So it's it was already a little bit um, like I wouldn't say that there's any profanity in this like originally. But I feel like with this particular script, it's sort of adapting it to today's environment, adding like a little more diversity. Um, it's a really interesting project and I really like the book series. I think it's really fun. Um, it's definitely something that I would probably pitch to streaming. It feels like a streaming show just in terms of the format. And uh, I think that a lot more sci-fi type stuff ends up streaming than on regular television um but yeah it's interesting because it, it's a, adapting a book series so the element of like how true are you staying to exactly what's in the book or you know what sort of adjustments to make to make it um a little bit better for uh, just a purely visual medium because in a book sort of a challenge in adapting it is being able to take all of these things that are going on inside of a character's head that you can't really see, but when you're reading a book, you can read, you know, their point of view. And then being able to translate that into something that people 
uh, can either see visually or is in the dialogue uh, where it wouldn't have before. It's sort of a, a challenge for that. Um, and then I'm kind of focused also on some more of the independent film scene and um, I've been working on a couple projects actually with Michael Casey, uh, who you had on here uh, recently. Oh, yes. We had Michael on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had him with uh, uh, for our watch party and we watched uh, Hunter's Moon. I had so much fun with that. Um, it was a lot of fun. We had a young director. Young, a young, uh, a young man just getting his feet wet. In fact, I do believe his movie has premiered, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, 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 let's see, and um, I think Tennessee Bigfoot. Uh, cool, that's awesome. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I told, I told him, you know, when I saw when I saw that he was doing a movie called Tennessee Bigfoot, I just had to go out there and go grab that because it's such an awesome name. So. Um, Khalil Neal was his name and he came out and he hung out and, um, and, uh, we did Hunter's Moon and then, um, then, and afterwards, oh, Gabriel was, was amazing. So after the show is over, you know, we talk a little bit after the camera's off and, um, I, I could not be more proud, um, to sit there and watch Michael reach out to this young man and say, Hey, I can, you know, if anything I can do to help you, I will. And you know, gave him his number. And, you know, and I'm thinking to myself going like, you know, that never happens in Hollywood. You know, you don't see that kind of generosity and heart and love, you know, to, you know, and it's just, it was so cool to see. And you can see the young man was really touched by that too. And he, cause he loved Hunter's moon. And then here he is, here's the guy who wrote it. Here's the guy who directed it. And he comes up there and he gets, Hey, if I can help you out, how priceless is that? I mean, if yeah, we all, yeah, isn't that something? I, he's an awesome guy. I mean, he, he's really a great person. Just, you know, oh. he, he is that type of person who is always helping somebody. Yes, yes. I, I Yes, absolutely. He is the real deal. He He's a, and you know, it's funny because it's like, I, I feel really blessed in the sense that I've been connected to just about everybody I've talked to on this show. I've always felt like they're like that too. Like they're very generous. They're very genuine. They're very compassionate. I, I honestly, I, I, I would be hard pressed to tell you anybody I've talked to on here that has not shown anything other than, you know, I, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing, I don't know what it is. I, to myself, I'm going like, you know, not every, it can't be acting because sooner or later you would catch that. But genuinely it speaking, you. It's you. Dylan, oh, I don't know. It's me at all. All I know is I talked to you and I talked to Michael and I talked to Khalil and I talked to, you know, I, I talked to so many people and they're so genuinely nice people. Um, I, I do feel blessed. And um, I thought it was really fun to have Michael and Khalil, uh, uh, you know, talking with each other peer to peer. Oh, I just thought it was amazing. One of my one of my favorite moments, and Michael Cassie is the like you said the real deal. Uh, what have you been working on? Now, I know that I know that uh, no tears in hell have has, has been stuck in development hell, right? Um, is that the I way to put it? I think it's getting close. I I think it might. Uh, I I can't say for certain, but I think it might come this year. So okay. Okay, because I know I know last time you were here, we were talking about that too. And it's like, but you know, that's what I tell people, you know, people who follow us here. Oh, uh Doreen Archambeau is here. Hi, Doreen. That's, that means, that's your mom. Oh, okay. Yeah. Welcome in, Mrs. Archambeau. How are you? Uh, uh that's that is awesome. That's awesome. I know for a second there too, uh Brene, I saw that too. I thought it was Darren too. I, when I glanced on it, I thought it was Darren. And then I looked and said, no, it's Doreen. So she, <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. Oh, yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, about, uh, uh, about the, let's go more into the writing. Um, who encouraged you more? Where did you, where did you get the encouragement to attempt to do screenwriting? I mean, and how do you keep the, the screenwriting separate from the acting side and from the producing side? Uh, how, how do you, you know, is, do you have a, a do you have a, a routine? Do you have a method when you do your writing? Um, well, I think 
from the beginning, like even before I wanted to be an actor, I wanted to be a writer. I actually a bit shy when I was a kid. So um, for me, I I would always write short stories like under my desk in cloud, get bored and I'd always read ahead in the book. So I, I would just start writing little stories. And then um, in, uh, in college, I was doing a bit of writing. And then uh, I wrote my first short film in 2017. Um, and I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess I just don't really like question if I could do something until I'm proven that I can't. So um, I guess that's sort of it. I I'm a person who kind of likes to write the script almost all at once. So um, if I have like five or six days off from work, like over a holiday or, or maybe like over the weekend, long weekend or something, um, I like to try to get as much done as possible because I just feel like for me, just um, keeping track of like where I'm going with the plot, it sort of helps me to at least do that bit um, more all at once and then add in like little details or subplots afterwards. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to uh, write like five or six strips this year. So um, oh. I'm taking a little pause from the writing for producing my play. Yeah, let's talk about that. So let's talk about your play, which is really exciting because it's an original play. Um, no, no, it's not. It's not an original play. No, this is not a. Uh, this is a, okay. So what play? It's, this is it's a, different. Yeah, it's a play somebody else wrote, but I fell in love with it, and I just when I read the character, it felt like the person had written it for me, even though they did not know me. Um, What's the? That's the lies the ugly bone, right? Yeah, it's called Ugly Lies the Bone, and it's a, a really beautiful play um, that I read at the beginning of this year, and I had actually auditioned for it at a different um, theater that was way off in Florida, and um, you, you know, ended up casting somebody in-house, which happens a lot. Um, mm. So a lot of times you'll audition for something, but they already have someone in mind. Um, but... I love the place so much that I just thought, well, you know, it's kind of a little bit slow in the industry right now. It might be a good time to you know, yeah. do a play. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just went through the rights process and had to get the licensing, um, book the venues. There's um, the Hollywood Fringe Festival is happening this June in Los Angeles. So it's going to be a part of that. Now, how does one do all that? Uh, how do you, how does one get get the control of a play from the playwright? Do you negotiate directly to with the playwright, or do you have to go through an agent? Uh, how, how does that work? And how long do you usually get to uh, have the play for? Like, uh, mm -hmm. it's the same thing with like with a movie where they option the rights, like they get to hold the rights for a year to do something with it, and, or, and you know either they do something with it or they lose it. Or is it you get to keep it or for as long as you need? It's a little bit different. Um, so this play is one that is like out of published plays where it has a publishing house that you license the rights from. And what you would usually do is put in uh, dates that you would are planning on doing the play. And then uh, usually the process takes between two and six weeks for them to prove the rights. And then you'll have it through the start of your rehearsal process until the end of your production run. Um, so the cost of that sort of depends on how long you're going to be putting the play on for, how many shows you have, the size of your theater. Uh, all those things kind of play into how much money you have to pay uh, in order to produce the production. Um, that's just for the, the script. Um, and the permission to to do the script, not for any of the the venue or anything. You have to that all separately yourself. Putting on a play, though, man, that's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot different than uh, you know filming because there's the whole rehearsal process, which you don't have very much in film. Mm -hmm. um, so we are going to be rehearsing a couple of days a week for about six to seven weeks. Um, why, and when why you're in a, that, why, why is that? Why is that, Gabriel? I was gonna, that's a good question. Why? Why do uh, you know when you do a, a a film, you don't have that much rehearsal time, but when you do a play, seven weeks. Why? Why so much? What? what what's the? What's the? Uh, 
Why does it seem to be so much more easier to do a film script than it is a live play? Well, the thing is, um, with a play, you only get one take. So uh, you have to really rehearse it because if you, um, like, let's say you miss your mark or you mess up the line, I mean, you can't go back. You can't do another take. So um, you really have to practice it. And um, the other thing is there's a lot more physicality involved um, and a lot more of, you know, making sure that you know where you're going to be in relation to the other performers on stage. Uh, whereas in a film, unless you're in like a super wide shot, not showing your whole entire body and it'll be, you know, you're shooting a couple lines at a time, maybe like a page or two play like this play, you have to be able to do 90 pages or 90 minutes of the script all the way through, not mess it up and be able to hit your marks. You know, the light is set in a specific spot. And if you don't hit that mark, uh, you're not going to be standing in the light that is set up and nobody's going to move it because it's hanging from the ceiling. Uh, sometimes they have, you know, can move it with the either digital or there's a person. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, you have to really be, you have to really be able to fine tune your performance and be able to keep it fresh for a lot of different days. Um, but also, you know, be able to, to do it in a way that's very consistent. Um, so you don't want to like suddenly do something completely crazy that throws off everybody else. Um, because unlike in film, the people are all there with you. Uh, sometimes people are with you in film, but then sometimes you are talking to nobody. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just uh, really. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> some place, some place you're out there. Yeah. You're out there by yourself on the stage and you got to give all that dialogue that, that is, uh, that is, it can be formidable. Um, uh, you know, it, it, what was that? Uh, maybe that's why they do Shakespeare all the time, where they have the head in there. Uh, was that a, a the skull in the head, and, and and he's talking to it all the time. Uh, you know, talking to the prop, making it, I guess, making the dialogue more easier. Um, but yeah, I, I just wondered about that because I do hear that a lot. Where you know, I have rehearsal for a theater play I'm doing, and I'm thinking, man, I never really hear anybody talk about like they'll sit there and say well, well we'll rehearse for a little bit you know uh, for a theater for a, a feature film yeah we'll just go there and run our lines through and whatnot and then we're ready to go and i always wonder like what's the big difference between you know because it's it's just uh it just seems to be a lot more it seems to be a lot more labor intensive acting wise doing the play than it does doing the feature film yeah, and uh, it's interesting because in, in film, the editing is such a huge part of what you end up seeing, and editing can really make or break a film. Whereas when you're on stage, you know, you're sort of, I mean, you're editing yourself, right? You and the director have like planned out how the scene's going to go, how long it's going to go for, uh, how long this beat is going to be. So, sort of um, a lot of the work that we don't necessarily see as performers in film, um, but that does take a long time as part of the process of putting on a play. Uh, well, now that you're the producer, you're you were like you're like the boss. So how did you pick your director? Uh, was a, was this a peer of yours? Did you did you uh, hire them through word of mouth? How, how did you how did you put together your team for your play? Well, it's really interesting because I was thinking of all the people I knew and and putting out uh, kind of some feelers uh, in terms of like a notice about looking for a director. And I actually met the director at a party. And I am not a person who um, goes to parties very much. I, uh, I like staying with my cats. Um, yep. But... <laughs> I went to a party and I met this person who just seemed really smart and like they were a similar personality to mine and that they they seemed like they would be a really good fit for this project. And so I just reached out and I said, you know, like, 
are you interested? Uh, and they wanted to get the player read, read the play. They presented their ideas of, you know, sort of how they would approach directing the play. And it was absolutely exactly how I was also envisioning the play going. Uh, so yeah, it just felt like a, a perfect fit and made them an offer. And then they signed on. So now, do you now as part of as, as you, you mentioned before about acquiring a play? Now, does that mean acquiring a known play, a play that's already been run before? Is it more difficult to acquire that than say a play that is relatively brand new, uh, you know, just getting off the ground, hasn't really been out there that long? Is it easier to is it easier to to get a I guess what I would say a fresh play more than they say a, a revival type play. Um, uh, yeah, there can be a lot of different elements in terms of licensing because um, let's say you're, you're trying to license a play in Los Angeles, but there's already a really big theater doing the play and they've already got the rights and you're a smaller theater. Uh, they won't let you do it in the same town because of competition. Um, so so it, de it depends like how long the play has been around. Um, but sometimes if it's a really known work, there's not as much competition in a sort of regional sense for you to be able to get the rights to it. Um, or if suddenly if something goes to Broadway, I've seen sometimes that people lose the rights to something or they're not able to acquire the rights because a show has to Broadway or they've gone to national tour. And, and and a play is just like a film in the sense that you could, you can only have it for a certain amount of time, right? In your town, and then you have to get then you have to either redo it or give it up, right? Yeah, you you pay for the amount of time that you have it and how many shows, um, and then yeah, once your time runs out, you'd either have to apply for an extension or you would have to stop doing it. <laughs> so. Now now did you um, do uh, did you do did you recruit the cast as well or? Or, or do original plays like that, do they have a casting director like feature films do? Or do you do it yourself being the producer? So for this, I did the casting myself um, with the director. So we actually just had our final round of callbacks today and we will be sending out some casting invitations in the next couple of days. So we're really excited about that. Now, do you tell the people who did not get a part do you reach out to them and let them know and thank them for their time and say that, you know, well, I did not work out this time down the road. Maybe we'll see each other again, because I know some people it's always kills me. I've heard about about people say they've gone out for parts and then they don't, you know, after a while, they just, they just don't hear anything else. And they know that they didn't get it. I, I've always just felt I always felt like it would be anybody who you invite to to to, you know, to audition. I always felt like anybody who you invite to audition you should at least say thank you. Is that is that is that is that old fashioned uh, to think that way, or because I, I have a feeling you thanked everybody that came out. I have a feeling that's what you did. Well, yeah, I I would definitely send a uh, you know thank you to everybody who sent in a tape. We definitely had um, some people, um, and this happens to everyone in casting who you'll send something and then they will uh, just ignore you and not send anything in. Um, but anybody who sent anything to me, I'll definitely, you know, thank them. And even if they are not a right fit for this project, um, they might be a right fit for something else. You know, not everybody is right for every project. And sometimes you see an actor who, who's like really incredible, but they just don't fit this specific part. And, uh, you know, we've even called in some people and said, oh, actually, we'd like to see you read for this one instead. Uh, we think it might be a better fit. So yeah, I would definitely reach out to anybody and let them know that, you know, even if it doesn't work out on this play, I love to keep them in mind for anything for the future and thank them for their great work because, you I'm know, not, it I'm takes not I'm not surprised hearing you say that. I'm, I really, truly am not. Uh, I, I think you're very classy and very professional for doing that and much respect because I have heard that way too many times where it's like they, that audition and that's it. They don't, they don't get anything. You know, the only thing they know, the only way, the only way they know they didn't get the part is because they don't get called back. But they never get a thank you. They never get a phone call. They never, you know, especially the ones that have made the first couple of rounds, right? Mm -hmm. So, like the first hundred people audition, 
Okay, maybe not. Okay, but let's say now you got 50 people. Okay, yeah, you invited those 50 out. I'm thinking maybe the ones that don't make it, you should actually go out there and say, hey, thank you so much for at least trying. You know, thank you for coming out. And by God, when you get down to like, you know, 24 or 20 people and you're and they're fighting for that one spot, I definitely feel the casting director should really reach out there and say, thank you so much for your effort and your time. Thank you so much. I, I don't know. To me, it's old fashioned, I guess. But I just feel like, man, they're professionals. You know, they're they're skilled, you know, and 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 they're and they're out there, you know, busting it. Um, that's why I guess maybe I wouldn't be a casting director. I don't know, because I, I would be too busy saying thank you to everybody. Um, so now you've you sent out your calls. Now, now you now how does that go? You take all the people's faces and you put them on a table and you go like and you walk through each one of them with your director and, and strength and weaknesses, availability, um, because that's got to be a big thing too, right? I mean, um, you, the, the, that's yeah, the most important and, thing for a stage actor is to be available. Yeah, they definitely have to be available for all the performances. It would be hard to work around it if somebody wasn't available for one of the performance dates, because then we would have to get somebody to cover. Um, our rehearsal schedule is quite flexible just because the structure of this particular play, um, there's only usually two to three people on stage at any one time. So we're able to rehearse with just one or two people per night. So let's say someone's not available on Tuesday and Thursday, that's totally fine. Um, and then what we would, what we did, I mean, uh, we talked about who we liked, how we felt the energy was, you know, did it match our our vision for the play? Um, of course, like chemistry with me because I'm cast in the lead role of Jess. Um, and then also um, making sure that there's sort of different, you know, energies or um, if, if so, if two people are too similar, we probably wouldn't cast both of those people to play two different roles. You kind of want each character to seem really like their own character. Um, so that definitely goes into it. Um, and then uh, and then for this particular play, there's a couple characters that are um, family members. So th there is an aspect of that as well. When we were doing the initial round of casting, you know, do these people seem like they could be related? Um, that's part of it as well. Um, yeah, so that, we didn't really uh, lay out the headshots. There's not a lot of laying out the headshots anymore because everything is digital. Um, uh, I have I have in the past made like collages digitally to show, um, you know, how do people look all together? Is it a dynamic cast? Um, yeah. Now, did you do in-person auditions or did you do uh, self-tapes? So the first round we had self-tapes that's just sort of initial screening and seeing um, kind of a base level of how we felt about various people. But then for the callbacks, we really wanted to have them in person. And I think it was really interesting because uh, quite a lot of people do a lot better in person than they do on the tape. And there's sort of this weird feeling, at least for me, when I'm watching tapes and there's sort of this like blank background and it feels like somebody is doing an audition. <laughs> Whereas when you're, you know, walking around in an actual room and you're seeing them move and they're not confined to this like tiny box with their like dog biting their ankles and their like, you know, neighbor knocking on the door and, you know, whatever crazy stuff is going on. Oh my um, gosh. I, it just I can't, imagine, I can't imagine what I can't imagine what some of those self tapes look like. I mean I mean I mean even the ones that they said, oh, this is just a lighter side of me, and then they show you know like a like a like a uh, uh to me I you know like a mistake or something like that, you know, just to show you I'm human. Um I mean I, I know a lot of people say they like doing self tapes because they can go back and redo the you know, redo it over and over and over, you know, get it perfect, get it perfected. I I don't know. I mean to me, I mean, I totally understand that. On one hand, I get that, and like you know, I'm, you know, like if I don't, you know, if I don't do it right, I'll, I can keep doing it until I feel comfortable. But I, I gotta admit too, though, there's something to be said about in person. You know, I think Daniel Hill said it best. You know, when he walks up there and he he looks dead in the eye of the casting director, puts his hand out, says, 
nice working with you, you know, you know, yeah. and, and make that contact, a human contact. I just read uh, this week uh, an actress was quoted as saying how she thought that uh, uh, self edition tapes were disrespectful. Um, mm. Go that far at all. In fact, you know, I, I wanted to sit there and tell them, tell the person, like, you forget why we got, why we have to do self tape, you know, tapes and uh, self uh, self tape. It's not. It wasn't always like that. We were, we had a pandemic. That's what caused that. So it wasn't a disrespect thing. It was just how that's how it was. But now that it's over with, should Hollywood, should Broadway get back to, into doing in-person auditions all the time now? I think it really depends on the role and the project because in a way there's a good thing about self-tapes and they can call in more people because they don't have to worry about the time constraint in the room. Um, I think that the... There's sometimes a balance with the Zoom ones. The other thing is that the self-tape can kind of allow people to do a lot more, um, you know, they can kind of have a better job, whereas the starving artist used to be this thing where you had to be constantly available all the time because you might get called in and it really limited the type of work that you could do to survive. And now it's a lot more possible to have quite a good job and be able to live a life where you aren't thinking, oh, I guess I'll just eat plain rice for dinner again today because I couldn't go to work because I had to go to an audition. Um, so I think that there are good things and bad things. I like now, at least for the union, they've made a rule where there have to be some in-person slots available. Um, okay. For me, I liked being able to call in the actors because there were some people who you watch their tape and and you thought, oh, I don't know if they're right, but maybe if we just told them this other piece of information or or we just said, hey, can you do it a little more in this style? And then when we were able to bring them in, we could see right away that this person who seemed a bit serious actually had a really funny side that you know we wouldn't have known if we hadn't right. at least been able to give them direction. And we might've just said no, when actually it turned it turns out, oh, they're great. You know, This is exactly what we're looking for. Um, and we know that because we could just say, hey, can you do it like this? And then right away they can do it. What's it what does it feel like to be on that side of the fence? You know, instead of you coming in and being the actress doing all that. Now you're the one doing the casting, you know, you're, you're doing the, the casting. How does it feel? I mean, what kind of emotions went through your head? You know, like when you're sitting there going like, I know what that person's feeling when they're trying to audition. You know, here I here I am. I have that role. You know, I don't want to say the power per se, but but you have the authority in that role. It means is you know it's you're producing it. You're it's your it's your it's your money. Um, but what's it like, you know, being on that other side of the fence and casting and knowing that 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 maybe that was you two weeks ago auditioning for a role yourself. Um, the, what did you take away from it? Well, I actually would really recommend to any actor to be at least at some point on the casting side because it. I think for me, it helps me not feel so personally about if I you know, am not cast in something. I can still feel confident that I did good work and that there are just so many reasons why somebody else might get a part or um you know that there might be many many people who do a job at something and you at the end of the day only pick one person um but then you know a lot of times i'll remember um, this person you know they weren't right for this but they were really great and if i'm ever casting this other thing like i absolutely know i would call them in because they would be really great at this specific thing um, so I think for me as a performer, being on the casting side lets me have a lot more fun with my auditions and not be as worried about trying to figure out like, what do they want? I have to be perfect, you know, because now, I've now seen all, like that. <laughs> now, were all the people that were auditioning for you, were they theater people, so to speak? I mean, were they... Pretty much just what their strength was, was doing live theater. The people who we tried, for you. 
Yeah, we tried to call in primarily people who have done live theater in the past, just because it's such a specific thing. And with a, a shorter rehearsal process, um, short as six weeks can be, you kind of want to know that somebody has had that experience before to be able to um, learn and do that many pages. Um, like for for example, I've been on film sets before where we've had to shoot 20 pages in a day and most film actors are accustomed to doing like two to five, maybe six pages a day. And so to be able to kind of hold all that information in your head at once is a different skill set. Um, and also being able to project yourself because doing theater is sort of like performing to a camera that is very far away from you. Um, so you have to be able to articulate yourself clearly um, in a somebody who's sitting in the 20th row, the 50th row, depending on how big your theater is, um, to understand the size of the space that you need to fill with both your voice and your physical presence. Um, so like moving your arm for a close up in a in in film, like let's say you have to bring something in, if you move your hand like an inch or you move your head an inch in a close up, it looks massive. Um, but if you're on stage, you have to really some exaggerate what you're doing in order for somebody far away to see it. Right, right, right. Now, how long? Uh, how long is the play going to last? Do you have an open end uh, to it? I mean, if it if it sells out for the for the initial run, do you have options to keep it going, or is this just going to be a limited run? Um. So we're only performing during the Hollywood Fringe Festival. So our preview is on June eighth. And then our final performance is June 30th. There is one preview and five shows. So uh, at the end of that, uh, that's kind of it. <laughs> yeah, there's no extension. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I, I know that. I know that some. I know that some uh, place that they uh, hit it off, they can they can extend it. Um, uh, we have questions. Uh, 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 actually, here our friend Gary has uh, he has a couple of questions for you. He goes, Gabriel. What age did you start acting, and who? Uh, what was your your first feature movie? And then he wants to. Uh, Gary wants to know what your favorite scary movie is. Oh, okay. So I started acting when I was fifteen, um, and that was in plays and musicals at school. And then um, my first feature movie was actually a film called Climate. Uh, it never finished, it never got released. Um, but I played somebody in prison, uh, which uh, is a casting for me, I guess. I also recently played someone in prison. Um, so that was my first feature movie, I guess, but didn't, I, I had a really small part. It was like a couple of lines, but my first like feature with a real part um, is No Tears in Hell. Um, so yeah, with the awesome Michael Casey. And, who just walked uh, into the door, making his Hollywood entrance. Yes, yeah. Look at him. Um, yeah, Climate was a, an interesting film because they were filming it in pieces. So at the time, we weren't even sure that it was a feature, and uh, yeah, it never, it never completed. Um, what kind of, what kind of, uh, what kind of reaction do you have as an actor when you hear that? You know, there's a lot of movies. They do get they do get made or they get like eighty percent made or ninety percent made or they do get all of you know or they or they will actually get made and of course you go in there you know your script you get you know you get your compensation or whatever you deal with but what's it feel like as a performer after like you know a year or a year and a half or two years and you look at it and you go like you know when's that movie coming out what's what kind of reaction do you get from that as an actor I mean. Is it just sort of, you know, do you ever just reach out and sit there and go like, you know, I'd like to see that movie get on the on the screen on some level. Um, what 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 options uh, do actors have when a movie is sitting on the shelf? Can, you know, let's say let's say you felt like you did some of your best work and, uh, you know, and Jack went over the hill. So you want part of that for your next reel. How do you go? How do you go about trying to get that? So you can, so you could, so you can still benefit from a movie that didn't see the light of day. 
what, what kind of steps can you take to to have people see your work that normally wouldn't? Yeah, uh, sometimes you can reach out to people. Like I, I was able to get a clip off that movie that never finished. They did they did send me the footage, um, and that was nice of them. I know sometimes on the indie film scene there's budgetary issues. I think that was the case with the movie. Um, then and I've been on the production side of movies before where, um, you know, short films where somebody was independently producing something and they got sidetracked or, you know, they, they decided that they wanted to invest their energy elsewhere. Um, that happens a lot with short films. Uh, but yeah, it, it can be disappointing. Um, but sometimes if you just reach out, someone will give you some of the footage. Um, and uh, it, yeah, it can definitely be difficult because as an actor, of course, you're always improving. Um, right. So you kind of want that most recent thing to show, say my best work. Uh, but sometimes you kind of just have to, uh, I guess, pitch yourself off of something you can't prove yet um, to say, hey, I just did this thing. You know, I did this type of character. I did a great job in it. Um, it's coming out this time. Um, and and just, you know, sell yourself. Um without having the footage. I I think that also that's sort of another thing where, you know, having been on a production side, you kind of do understand a little bit more about what happens. Um, yeah, as sometimes, you know, there's nothing you could do, right? Like, mm -hmm. unless you're in control of the movie, there's nothing you could do, I was, so. I was, in a, I was in a group this week and, um, and there was an actress talking about that and saying she wanted to get, you know, she wanted to get part of her work for her reel. And she had reached out to this, this, this person and said, Hey, can you please send me, you know, some of the, some of the footage. And initially they said, yes. And then after that, then, then didn't hear back from the person. And, and she was wondering like, you know, how, how many times should I reach out to ask them to send me the, 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 the you know, the part I want. And pretty much, pretty much in mass, the group is like, ask until you get it because it's your, it's you, you deserve to get it. I mean, you signed up for it. Um, so, you know, it's not your fault that, you know, it may be necessarily be the, it may be not be the director's fault or the producer's fault either. Like you said, I mean, a lot of time could be lack of, of funds, you know, to finish the film or whatnot, but that still doesn't la doesn't still doesn't excuse the lack of courtesy by sitting there going like you know it's not going to go anywhere i know it's not what i can do is i can go ahead and give this young lady what she wants or this young man what he wants because you know if i could help them out you know that's my goal as, as a director your goal is always to bring a good story to the screen and to improve the actors you're working with to make them look good and make them you know make, help them improve their own craft that's part of a director's job um and uh at least that's how i feel and so you know i think if they do call and they say hey can i get a uh, can we get you know can i get the clip of that scene that big emotional scene then i think it's a, I, I think it's just the right thing to do you know unless 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 you're sitting there saying i'm in negotiations with a company to watch the film you know to show the film you know give me give me another three months and if it doesn't happen for three months i'll be glad to send it to you uh, and Michael just mentioned up here that not only are you the best uh, and that he adores you. Our friend Anthony is here, too. And he says, good to hear from you. Uh, he was here the last time. Uh, and uh, Michael says that uh, No Tears is coming out uh, in either August. That's my birthday month. So we'll go for an August, re August release or September, uh, depending on a possible theatrical. So hopefully, hopefully that, that, that hopefully it's Lionsgate again. That would be amazing. I would love that. Um, I can't wait to see it. Uh, and what's your favorite scary movie? Oh, this is a hard one. My favorite scary movie. Just go for the, the, just go, for is... the Friday, go, go for the Friday the Thirteenth remake, so we can talk about Derek some more. <laughs> I uh. Here's what maybe it's maybe it's the sequel, but they always make me laugh. Um, like a lot of a lot of scary movies 
really make me laugh. I think my fa I think the movie that I found the scariest is probably Rosemary's Baby. That's that's probably the mo the movie that most genuinely scared me because I think that like in society as a woman, I related very heavily to absolutely no one believing you about something. Um, right. And this like horrible thing happened to her. So even though it's, it is like this crazy, you know, demon thingy, um, it felt very realistic. Um, and that I, I found that very scary. Uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes the older scary movies make me laugh. I don't know why. The Ring really makes me laugh. The Ring, really, man. That's yeah, one of the few, I, that's one of the few Friday. That's one of the few PG thirteen movies that had me creeped out. Like I'm going, like that's creepy. You know, it was like one of the few PG 13s to do that because most of the PG thirteens, I'm eating popcorn and and reading a book. But a rated R, good rated R, good. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know. That's how I'm always at the edge of the seat. But when I get a good PG-13 film that really has that power, that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm paying attention to it, just like, you know, and The Ring, that, that creeped the hell, that creeped me out. <laughs> People I used to it. tell me in school, but I had really, really long hair when I was a kid. And uh -huh. people used to tell me in school that I looked like the girl from The Ring. Oh, God. You should have did the, you should have did the walk. I know. You should, yeah, you should have like, oh, really? Okay, I'll show you. I'll show you the ring. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, I found out about uh, uh, Rosemary's Baby, which I had no idea. A um, uh, uh, director, uh, director and producer named William Castle, who grew, who, who became famous for making schlock films during the 50s and 60s. Uh, some true classics, uh, true classics. He actually was gonna. He actually bought the rights to Rosemary's Baby before anybody else knew about the book. The book hadn't even been published yet, and he bought the rights to the book. When it came out and it caught fire, everybody went to everybody went to get the rights to the book. But William Castle already had them, and he wanted to direct the film, but uh, but the the studio wouldn't let him do it. They, they, you know, he was a, he was you know he was sick at the time. And so I said, we're going to go with a, a, another director, but, you know, you could produce it. So he produced Rosemary's Baby. I had no idea. Wow. Yeah, William Castle. It's like, that's, that was the, I had no idea he had such a, he had a hand in that movie. Um, but, uh, yeah, Rosemary's Baby, uh, Supernatural Horror, uh, I'm about that. that. That's what scares me, too. A good Supernatural Horror, yeah, <laughs> I'm about that. Uh, big shout out to you for liking that movie, by the way. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. So let's talk a little about about the movie uh, uh, Lion's Girl because Lion Girl because we talked a little bit earlier about uh, Derek's part in this movie, but now it's time to talk about your part. Now I know you said you're on on set for a day, uh, yeah. but let's talk about it. Let's talk about how you how you. Well, first of all, how did you get the role? Well, I actually was a replacement. Um, so somebody else was originally cast and then um, a friend of mine was in production on that film and um, he reached out and he was like, hey, I've got this role. I think you'd be great for it. You know, do you want to? I sent in a picture. Um, I think he showed my reel to the director and the director was like, yeah, great, bring her in. And, the, and it was shooting in two days. Um, so I read the script and I learned my lines and then um, I got to do like a really cool, fun uh, stunt. So that was cool. Uh, I'd never done that before. I mean, am I allowed to say spoilers to people? who? Yeah. Spoiler, spoilers alert. Uh, so what was the stunt? Um, so so I, my character it hangs herself. So I had to be in this harness and there's, there's like a wire coming up and then I'm delivering this monologue. And then I like fall, so um, I got to do do that stunt where I like basically kicked out my own chair and just fell. Uh, it wasn't like really far, but it was pretty fun. Wow! Now, uh, uh, do you like doing? You like doing your own stunts, though, don't you? I, I do. That's how I hurt my. Uh, well, I hurt myself training Muay Thai. Um, so I I sprained my wrist. I sprained my ankle. 
just breaking myself doing Muay Thai. Um, because I do like, I do like doing my own stunts. I like fighting, uh, like on screen and, um, I get to do a lot of cool, uh, stunt stuff for second chances. So, uh, another Michael Casey uh, special. So, um, I'm excited about that as well. And, uh, yeah. I really like, I really like, I, I guess fighting. I wouldn't like to really be hit, but I like pretending, like most things. Uh, yeah, you don't hear that too much. I like, I like to fight. What, what would you rather do, a romantic scene or a fight? Oh, take me up. Fight, fight, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fighting. Um, so you got to go on there. You saw the, you, you, you know, had you ever heard of a uh, of, of lion girl beforehand? Did had you known about the the the, the comic book? Uh. It was a, a comic book over in Japan. Have you ever heard about it beforehand? Um, and what was it like? I mean, did you get a chance to actually do talk to Derek and um, and and uh, 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 Tori? Uh, did you get a chance to talk to both of them on set, or or did you meet the rest of the cast, or were, was you? Did you just have you come in for your stunt and your and? I mean, did you get to? Did, were you allowed to to hang around and watch the process? Yeah, I, I got to meet quite a few people. I didn't get to meet uh, Derek because I I shot and then my I was wrapped and he wasn't uh, he wasn't there. Um, I think he was coming in, but way later that day, so I would have just hung around um, properly. But I did get to talk to Tori and meet Tori. We were in the makeup room together, and she's really really sweet, super nice. Um, and so I got to talk to her and I, I still talk to her occasionally and she's really cool. Um, and I met a couple of the other people who were playing some of the other characters um, and everyone was super nice. Uh, but I was, all, I was only on set for maybe like half a day, even a full day. Cause I, I don't talk, I don't talk to any people. Um, so yeah, I, I came in, got my makeup, I got my hair, got my costume uh they rigged me up in this stunt. i think uh the horror cat dad i think that the hanging is probably the craziest stunt i've done maybe um maybe something i think the coolest looking stunt is probably in second chances although i did quite a long fight scene in no tears uh but um yeah i met a lot of people met the director of course carando he was really cool um like super nice and um yeah and, and then we had a, a showing of the film so um i did see derek at the showing okay okay so let's talk a little bit about uh let's talk a little bit about second chances because that's like you said that's a that's a uh, i believe that is a tv show right yeah, uh, uh, Michael, what am I allowed to say about Second Chances? I don't know what I'm uh, allowed to say. It is on the IMDb, so I don't know. We'll let Michael decide. We'll let, I, we'll guess let... I, could, I guess I could tell you I'm recurring over two seasons. That You could tell that from the IMDb. Yeah. Uh, now, now, uh, yeah. Now, now, this is how did you get? How did you get uh, 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 for Second Chances? And. Um, does I guess can we ask when uh, can we ask when uh, second chances will be hitting or do we have to uh, we have to wait on that? I don't know. We we'll have uh, to ask Michael. That's another that's another Michael Casey question. Um, I how did I get on second chances? The answer to that is also Michael Casey. So, um, yeah, because we had already worked together on um, we'd already worked together on No Tears, so. Um, right. Yeah, so that's I already cool, knew. Michael. That's, that's cool though, because you know, to me, to me, that's you know, I always like it when a director, you know, product, director or producer, they start building that, they start building that John Ford uh, Rolodex, you know, of of actors they can that they can depend on. You know, my, John Ford was a very famous director, and he had a Rolodex of at least a hundred actors, and every time that he got a, a a movie to direct, he would go to that Rolodex, roll through, and pick out the actors that he wanted for the for the uh, for the movie. And you watch a John Ford movie, and there's constantly you constantly see the same faces, different roles, but they're always the same constant faces. It's because of the uh, the building of the trust and the talent. Uh, Michael says he doesn't know when it comes out. Trying to find out. Okay. Um, 
So I tell you what, we'll leave that one alone then. So that way, that way, when you come Next. back, uh, Michael and you can come back. We can talk about second chances. Uh, that that would be cool. That would be fun. That would be cool. Um, um, Lord Lord Gary, I I do do fight scenes, uh, and I I've never had a stunt double. So yeah, I do. So far, I own stunts uh, on everything I've done. Um, I I worked really hard for about two years. I I have a short film of She Hulk on YouTube. Um, and I worked really hard for two years. I was really trying to um, get a new bodybuilder shape, uh, but no matter what I could do, even though I was massively strong, I looked identical to how I had looked before I started working out. Um, but I did uh, I did a lot of fight stuff for that. I did fight stuff in No Tears, Second Chances, and, uh, and then the stunt drop in Lion Girl. Um, yeah. Is that, something, is that something you want to do in the future? I mean, when you know, are you, I mean, do you, are you going to be looking for more action? More are you, are you? Do you consider yourself more of an action type of actress uh, versus more like a dramatic actress? Or uh, in your opinion, I mean, where, where do you think your strength is at? I I definitely feel like my strength is in dramatic performance, but I think that that aspect of it is in kind of like intense characters that lend themselves to roles that often end up fighting in some way um here's my my movie poster for top gun maverick oh okay because uh, i'm a really big tom cruise fan i right, also right. i also not hanging up have a dead reckoning part one poster um so i i really like that kind of aspect of of getting to do the fights and um i probably wouldn't do anything like extremely dangerous i don't think i could i could not see myself um riding a motorcycle off of a cliff but right. um i'm definitely down to do um normal level fight things um i don't think i would want to I'm, jump I'm, out of I'm, a plane yeah i like tom cruise too but i i gotta be honest with you i just picked up dead reckoning one I gotta tell you though, I'm grumpy at him though because I don't want him to kill off Rebecca Ferguson because she was like she was so cool. <laughs> I was I was grumpy about that as well, and I was also I was also grumpy about the fact that um, Haley Atwell has the part I wanted. So <laughs> yeah, it's like okay, how come you can't kill Haley Atwell? I mean, she's all right and everything else. Why can't you just kill her and save Rebecca Ferguson? I mean, you know, that's just that's just me, of course. But I like Haley. I like Haley. Well, I guess I guess they made it up for it because she got killed in uh, Doctor Strange. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, see, Michael um, Michael Bernard is in the group as well. Just walked in the chat, uh, and he is a film director himself. Uh, in fact, we will be talking to Michael and a couple of his castmates uh, for our watch party in May. That's right. Uh, you should have killed me. We're going to be doing a watch party and commentary with filmmaker Michael Menard, uh, and that will be a lot of fun. That's a really fun film. That's a really fun film. Uh, and he'll be here with us in a couple of months uh, or next month. Uh, let's see. What Tom Cruise uh, film would you pick if you could act along with him in, a, in one of them? That's a really good question. If you could be cast, if you could be cast against in one of his films, which one would you do? This is a real hard case. There's a, a couple options. Mm -hmm. um, I would say either I would like to do Haley Atwell's part in the most recent Dead Reckoning, or um, I would have to go with um, Oppen and Jerry Maguire. Oh. I know it's not an action movie. No, it's a dramatic movie. But I really, I really love Jerry Maguire. So yeah, it's a real sweet movie, isn't it? Yeah, it's ah, oh, it's a great, it's a great movie. I don't think people really see Tom Cruise. And do you, have you worked with an actor that carries a reputation on stage for not necessarily typecast per se, but just a reputation? Like when you think of Tom Cruise, you think of action. When you think of Haley Atwell, you think of action. You know, uh, you know, when you think of you know, or you know. Um, like Derek, you think of horror movies, you know, they got that, you got that persona, they got that badge with them. Um, what, what badge do you think if people, if people saw you walk on stage, what do you, what kind of badge do you think that, that you would be carrying, 
what would you be well uh what do you think that you'd be uh, known best for hmm I feel like <laughs> your, your mom just sold you out. <laughs> she knows. She knows. I'm always talking about Tom. Uh, she, she girls over Tom Cruise big time. <laughs> I do. I have a Tom Cruise t-shirt. I'm not wearing it right now, but um, I also have a Leroy Jethro Gibbs t-shirt from NCIS. Ooh, um, Ziva and Tony are coming back. I know. I really want to get on that show. Um, well, I feel like. I, I feel like my like best skill is playing people who are like very tough exterior, but then see their layers of like vulnerability. Uh, I don't know. I don't necessarily know what typecasting that would be. Um, it's funny that you say you think action when you think Haley Atwell, because for me, I was a big fan of British movies. When I think Haley Atwell, I think period drama. That was she did like almost exclusively period pieces for a really long time until like Captain America. Yeah, I I I, I know there's another actress that works uh, uh, in a lot of dramatic pieces too, and that's uh, Gemma Atherton, which yeah. I absolutely I love I love her. She's really sweet. She does a lot of amazing movies. Uh, and she you're right, she does a lot of uh, drama as well. Um, yeah, okay, how about that? What what role what would you like to opposite uh, uh I mean do you like Haley Atwell so you like Haley Haley Hatwell what female peer would you like to 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 have a, a scene with if you had a, had a if you had a, had a fight scene with with a with a uh, we'll, we'll go both if you could have a fight scene with one actress and a dramatic scene with one actress who would they be and why because that's a really that's that's a really tough question uh, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned because there's two, it's two different style of acting. Um, so how would you, how would you respond to that? I think like for, well, for my, I really love the actress Haley Bennett and I would love to do dramatic acting with Haley Bennett. I think she's amazing. And I like not enough people talk about her. Best guest ever. Best guest ever. If Anthony from Fever Greenland Theater is still in the chat. Raise your hand and who I've been talking about the last three years. I I love Haley Bennett. I think she's Me great. Too. I'm really excited for her Widow Clickaw movie to come out. I can't wait either. I I'm a huge huge Haley Bennett uh, fan. I'm like uh, Haley Bennett's like my Tom Cruise. She's amazing. She's oh, great. I'm she can do all sorts of different things, and I really like all of her performances. I, I I wish like people would talk about her more, you know. I, that's that's actually I've been I've been trying for a year. <laughs> I've been trying for over a year to try to get her to come onto the show and do an interview with me. I have no shot at that, <laughs> but I keep trying. I keep hoping. Um, that's amazing. I love Hay Haley. I think she's I think she's absolutely uh, she's very enchanting. Um, yeah, uh, and then a uh, a fight scene. I feel like. <sighs> I would have to pick. Um, I would love to fight and win against Kate Blanchett. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, she's she's pretty formidable. Uh, uh, she she she's is doing yeah. action now. Yeah. Well, she's done some action before. She has done. She did mm -hmm. a, a movie uh, called uh, Hannah. With a, yes. a sorry one, yeah, that was really good. Yeah, she's been doing uh she's been doing more action as of late. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, and that's one thing too about Haley is that Haley can do action too. She did the Magnificent Seven, and she did this awesome underrated thriller called Christie. Highly recommend that one, boys and girls. That movie is bonkers. I love that one. Um, so what's coming up after the play? I mean, I know the play is a thing right now. Um. But after, uh, are you looking ahead to after the play is over, or is that just your total focus? Do you do you look ahead when you have a project in front of you, or is it only is it only what you're working on right now that matters to you? I I probably do look ahead like more than I should. I probably should be more focused on what is in front of me. But 
I'm always excited about like the next thing. Um, right now I am primarily focused on the play, but um, a big part of what I'm doing with the play is trying to get a lot of press and a lot of um, in industry people invited to the play because I think it's a really good opportunity to, um, you know, get a little bit more notice um, than just, you know, you can pay for all these casting director workshops and they see you for like 30 seconds. And I feel like if I can get a few people at least to go see the play, um, then they'll have 90 minutes because my character basically doesn't leave the stage except for about one scene that lasts two and a half minutes. So um, right. after after the play, I don't know. I just got new headshots. I got um, hopefully right after the play, uh, a couple months later, we'll have notes coming. So it'll be good. Um, and uh yeah hopefully i'll be able to get in some more projects just from having a right. little more awareness of well, my existence well it looks like it sounds like uh absolute plays over with and at least you know you have uh at least one project coming coming out in september or, or august or september uh with uh no tears in hell so you got that coming out um i have a feeling the play is going to do absolutely wonderful I, I love plays. I, I do, and I think it's I think I think it's very uh I think it's very cool. You're doing one. Um, you're producing it. You're you cast it. You're you know you're you know it's all it's all you. Um, and um, I think it's going to do very very well. I, I'm excited for you. Uh, and um, thank you for coming back and visiting with us. Um, Thanks for having me. I. I yeah, this is now. I'm so now you know you know we're going to be talking about Haley after 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 we go off camera. Uh, I know. Yeah. I didn't even get to show my cheetah. My cheetah is here. Oh, show show us your cheetahs. Cheetahs are always good. They're always welcome. Oh, oh wow. He, is he a Russian blue? Yes, he's very. Oh, he's very busy now. Look at him. Oh, now he's, he's very, very handsome. He talks a lot, doesn't he? He talks a bit. The, our tabby he, talks even more, but I I won't be able to bring him on. He doesn't like being picked up. But this guy isn't isn't mine. He's just he's wow. Really what's, his, what's what's his what's his name? His name is a Smoky Loaf Cat, and uh, he's a very good boy. Both, both rescues. Yeah, they they came from the same McDonald's parking lot. So, <laughs> well, at least he didn't get tagged with the name of Big Mac. I I always say I hamburgled them. Um, <laughs> And he does. He does have a particular affinity for burgers. Um, you know, that's one thing I have to sit there and say that uh, 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 Paladin does not. He he does not. He likes the idea of people food, but he doesn't eat people food. He come by. He'll come by. He'll sniff my hamburger. Uh, he'll sniff whatever I eat, like a tuna fish or whatever. He'll come over and take a look at it, but he never tries to eat it. He he has no interest. And uh, I crack a can of tuna. He'll come over, sniff, meow. And then, uh, uh, and then I'll put a little bit down on the floor. Walks away. Wow! Um, oh no, my my cats—they love people food, and um, the tabby really likes sweets as well, like muffins I, and cookies, and um, and then this guy he likes he likes more savory foods. Like he he likes to eat vegan cheese. Oh, he has to go. He's very busy. Um, <laughs> and and vegan mayonnaise. He doesn't know it's fake. He does, okay. Now I I heard that that cats do not have a uh they don't they don't they don't they can't they don't have taste buds they can't taste sweet. I I disagree. I heard that too, but I just disagree. love sweets. I I've seen I seen cats many cats they go after that ice cream they go after the yogurt. I know that they have they have taste buds. They, I guess they, it's no. because of the protein something about the proteins in them. Uh, you know, I lost I lost a bet last year. I don't think I mentioned this to you, uh, but I, I had a bet with a friend of mine uh, for, on a football game, and we, and the we you know the loser had to had to have uh, cat food, and uh, so I lost last year. So I had to eat cat food on camera. The only thing I can tell you right now is I'm surprised that we're that the, the human race is alive, because if if the cats really realize what they're eating and how nasty it tasted, they kill us all. <laughs> they would kill. They would kill us all. Cat food is vile. <laughs> That's terrible. 
Oh, I've never yeah. tried it, but yeah, well, I, I won't. Yeah, don't you don't want to do that. My friend Larry, he might he might already he might have tried cat food, but it's the most some of the most vilest thing. It's just like this is why you guys meow at us for. This is what you want us to feed you. Oh, oh if, they, if they had any sort of common sense, they would kill us all in our sleep for for feeding them that. <laughs> but so, sometimes I try to make them like real chicken, like real, like a real feast, and and they don't even like it as much as their cat food. I don't know why. No, I don't either. And I know people will go out there and they, they cook their cat or their dog all this fresh meals. You know, they'll get their put veggies in it and stuff like that, make a gourmet meal. And they'll feed it to them, and it's like you know, like I feed I feed Palad and I feed him IMs. Uh, well, I either he either got IMs or he got a uh, 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 he got a uh, science diet. Those are the only two food I will feed my cat, and um, uh, and occasionally raw blood because uh, he is a cheetah. Um, but um, but that's it. I I don't feed him anything else other than that. Uh, I just no. I mean, well, he gets some canned treats, but but as far as dry food goes, I won't feed him anything that. So I do look at people who do that, you know, that cook up their cats and dogs, those meals. I, you know, I know some people like they make fun of it. I don't, I think it's very sweet actually. If the dog and the cat loves it, like I heard cat, I heard this one lady, she was sitting there and says he absolutely loves carrots and she made mm. steamed carrots, put them in front of him. And that cat went, to, he went downtown. He was happier as hell. Yeah. Eating carrots. Um, let's see my, oh, okay. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Larry's cats tried to bury the wet food. Larry's Larry's cats are are, are becoming uh, aware. They're becoming self aware of what we're feeding them. You might be in danger, Larry. Better have a grab. Better have a, a grab bag because once they realize that you're giving them the food that they hate, you're in trouble. All right, Gabriel. Thank you so much for coming out. And thank you to your mom too. Thank you, uh, Thanks, Mrs. Harkin, for coming out. And Michael, both Michaels, Michael Cassie, uh, the wonderful Michael Cassie, and uh, the wonderful Michael James Bernard. Thank you guys all for coming out, Larry and Anthony. And uh, I had a great time uh, tonight. And uh, wow, Haley Bennett, too. Oh, we're going to talk. Um, uh, tomorrow night, we'll be back tomorrow night with uh, actress and entrepreneur Allie Eisman will be here. Uh, that was going to be... Um, it's going to be a very interesting show tomorrow and one I've been looking forward to for a year. And, um, and, and we're going to be talking to Allie. Allie's got a new uh, uh, business called Passport to Pleasure. And we're going to be talking about relationships tomorrow. I'm not sure if I'm the right guy for that, but I definitely got a lot of questions for it. So uh, we'll, we will see. Uh, we will see. And Allie is a wonderful, very beautiful young lady. And I can't wait to talk to her. And then on Thursday, we have uh, uh, actor, director Austin Gallant will be here, and we'll be talking about his film, um, uh, Sweet Killing Machines. I think that's what it is. Uh, and uh, I have to double check that. I have to start making better notes. Uh, but yes, thank you so much for uh, to the chat for showing up today. I appreciate it. We will see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock for Allie Eisman. Uh, later on today at 11 o'clock Eastern time, the Boneyard is going on with Mr. Bones. Um, and I will put that, uh, let's see. Well, I'll put that down in the description box if you guys want to go over and hang out with them. All right. Uh, stay right where you're at, Gabriel. And to everybody else, thank you so much. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Peace. Oh, great. I love that. <laughs> Holy cow. Am I still alive? Yes, I'm still alive. Hey.